Welcome, and thank you for joining us. My name is Antigone Ladd, and I serve on the board at the Adams County Historical Society. For today's program, we are partnering with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and we're going to take a look at some of the major changes in medicine brought about by civil war. Our nation's four-year struggle caused unprecedented casualties, and both sides had to struggle to cope. Out of those struggles were born changes in the system of dealing with battlefield casualties and even new treatments in medicine. We're going to start by visiting some of the battlefields and looking at where these changes occurred and talking about the people who made them happen. Hey everybody, this is Jake Wynn from the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. And we are here on Herring Creek, which is just north of the James River. Uh, and this is the northern boundary, one of the northern boundaries of the Uni Union Army encampments here at Harrison's Landing in the summer of 1862. And this is a really important story because this is going to begin the evolution of military medicine during the American Civil War. In July of 1862, a new commander of the medical department of the Army of the Potomac is going to arrive here at Harrison's Landing. For those of you who have followed the museum's accounts uh, on social media, uh, been to our museum, seen our programs in person, chances are you've probably heard the name of Jonathan Letterman. This is where he is going to take medical command of the Army of the Potomac and usher in some amazing, incredible evolutions and changes within that Army's medical department that are going to ring down the ages uh, to us in the 21st century. We're going to talk a little bit more about that as we go through our program today. Um, but this site here, Herring Creek, which is located just behind me, as I mentioned before, is the northern one of the northern boundaries of the uh, U.S. Army encampments here at Harrison's Landing. Just to our south, are located two plantations that are going to be occupied by the U.S. Army uh, during the summer of 1862. That would be the Berkeley Plantation and the Westover Plantation. And those particular spots are important because the James River was deep enough for uh, ships to uh, arrive and come up here to this part of the of the James River, uh, including gunboats, which are going to come and are at the end of the seven days battles uh, are going to come and assist the Army of the Potomac under General George McClellan, uh, provide more firepower and support and prevent uh, Confederates under Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia from to get at the Harrison's Landing position. It also is going to become the supply depot for the Army of the Potomac as well in the summer of 1862, and ultimately the medical evacuation point. And just like all of our other on-tour videos, we are on location on battlefields at historic sites, uh, but it's important for, to, for me to reference here that we're not gonna be talking about the, the tactics on the battlefield, the, the strategy of the, uh, of the Army commanders. We're not gonna be talking about Lee. We're not gonna be talking talking about McClellan in any of these videos. Uh, instead, we're going to be focused on the medical aspect uh, of these battles, as we have been on the On Tour series, whether it's at Harper's Ferry uh, or at any of the other locations that our On Tour series goes to, we focus on the medical story. And in the seven days campaign, here it comes to a conclusion uh, in the aftermath of the battle at Malvern Hill. U.S. Army is going to back itself up against the James River, again with those gunboats providing support. And this is where all of the casualties from the seven days are ultimately going to be collected with the U.S. Army. They're going to come into Harrison's Landing, be put into makeshift hospitals. Uh, the uh, Berkeley uh, Plantation, the, the Harrison House as it, it is known, uh, is going to become a hospital. Uh, that is going to care for all of these casualties. Ultimately, in the seven days, the bloodiest week in American history to this point, U.S. Army is going to suffer 15,000 casualties. Many of them are going to be wounded soldiers, also sick soldiers who are going to need care uh, at Harrison's Landing. And this is going to create a major medical crisis here at, at this point. And so we have a new medical director that is going to come in. Uh, 
Up to this point in the Peninsula Campaign, the medical director of the Army of the Potomac is a guy named Charles Tripler. My colleague, John Lustria, did a wonderful presentation uh, about Tripler and his time with the, uh, with the U.S. Army during the Civil War. You can find that on our YouTube channel. You'll find it in the description down below, a link to where you can watch that. Uh, Tripler faces innumerable challenges during this campaign, and the U.S. Army is really unprepared to deal with the medical crisis of fighting on the Virginia Peninsula. A scale of fighting, the the scale of these armies is just so much more vast than anything in American history to this point. And so it's understandable that there are so many medical challenges. But by this point, uh, especially at the end of the seven days where we have all of these thousands of casualties that need to be dealt with, there need to be some major changes within the U.S. Army's medical department, within the Army of the Potomac's medical department as well. The encampment at Harrison's Landing also provides innumerable health challenges to the wounded soldiers, the sick soldiers, Soldiers, and just the average soldier who may not yet have fallen ill or may not have been struck down during the Seven Days Campaign. Harrison's Landing on the James River is a fetid, smelly, hot, humid place in the summer of 1862. You have a, an exhausted, tired army that has just suffered day upon day upon day of uh, fighting, of combat, of retreating back to this point on the James River, they are at the end of their rope as an army, as an organization. And so this army is particularly vulnerable to, to disease, uh, to uh, poor morale as well, and their nutrition is not helping them. Many of these soldiers over the course of the Seven Days Campaign that find themselves here at Harrison's Landing, they are going to have been coming off a week plus of eating uh, rations, field rations, hardtack, some salt pork that is pretty nasty and gnarly uh, after day upon day in the hot sun. Uh, so this is going to be the challenge that is going to face the Army of the Potomac at Harrison's Landing throughout the summer of 1862. Thankfully for them, they have a new medical director who is going to be coming in, who is going to usher in sweeping changes. That is going to be a medical officer in his mid-30s from western Pennsylvania named Jonathan Letterman. Major Jonathan Letterman is going to be appointed uh, to the medical command of the Army of the Potomac uh, at the beginning of July 1862, just as the seven days is coming to an end. And as he arrives, he is going to note the pretty horrific conditions that wounded soldiers, sick soldiers are facing here at Harrison's Landing, and the risks of encamping an entire army of 100,000 plus men on this bend in the James River, in this low country, which had already in the spring of 1862 shown to have a high propensity to spread disease. After all, there is a disease known as Chickahominy fever that had been spreading in the Army of the Potomac throughout the spring of 1862 as they're campaigning down here. This is an area known to be rife with disease. Uh, and so this is one of the first things Letterman's gonna note upon his arrival, as well as dealing with all of these battle casualties from the intense combat of the Seven Days. He is gonna write uh, a memoir in 1866, 1865 and 1866, Letterman Will, that describes a lot of the conditions he faced. And he looked back on his arrival here at Harrison's Landing in July of 1862, and he described in that memoir, Medical Recollections of the Army of the Potomac, the conditions that were being faced here uh, by the Army of the Potomac. This is what he wrote. He said, quote, the troops for several consecutive days and nights had been marching and fighting among the swamps and streams which abounding in this part of Virginia render it an almost Serbonian bog. The malaria arising from these hotbeds of disease began to manifest its baneful effects upon the health of the men when they reached Harrison's Landing. He continues, the labors of the troops had been excessive, the excitement intense. They were obliged to subsist upon marching rations and little time was afforded to prepare the meager allowance. They seldom slept and even when that opportunity offered, it was to lie in the mud with the expectation of being called to arms at any moment. Again, Letterman is arriving in an army that is exhausted uh, physically, mentally, emotionally by the experience of fighting in the Seven Days Battles. Letterman described the medical situation here. He says, quote, the nature of the military operations unavoidably placed the medical department in a condition far from satisfactory. The supplies had been exhausted almost entirely or had been, from necessity, been abandoned. 
The hospital tents had almost uh, had been almost universally left behind or destroyed. The ambulances were not in condition to render effective service, and circumstances required a much larger number of medical officers to perform the duties of that portion of the army. It was impossible to obtain proper reports of the, of the number of sick in the army when it reached Harrison's Landing. One of the first things Letterman is going to do when he arrives here is thrash together a system to evacuate patients from Harrison's Landing by water. And this is going to be done in partnership between the U.S. Army, the U.S. Navy, as well as the United States Sanitary Commission, a civilian organization, a relief organization that is going to provide invaluable service to the United States Army in the spring and summer of 1862, because it is going to charter a makeshift hospital ships that are going to ply the waters of the James River, the Chesapeake Bay, the Potomac, moving patients from the James River, uh, from the battlefields on the peninsula to Fortress Monroe at the end of the Virginia Peninsula, and then off to Washington, D.C. as to makeshift military hospitals there. Now, among the volunteers aboard those makeshift hospital ships uh, was a nurse named Clarissa Jones. Uh, she was a native of southeastern Pennsylvania, of the Philadelphia area and the suburbs. Uh, she was a teacher by training. Uh, however, she, in the summer of 1862, is going to begin a campaign, a series of campaigns, as a volunteer nurse with the United States Army. And she is going to begin that campaign in the summer of 1862. She closes up her school in Germantown, Pennsylvania, and travels down to Virginia uh, in July of 1862 to work aboard the Sanitary Commission ships that are plying the waters of the James. She served aboard the ship State of Maine, a steamer uh, that is going to serve as a hospital uh, ship during the summer of 1862. The reason I'm bringing up Clarissa Jones is because we have an amazing collection of letters and diaries from Clarissa Jones in the collections of the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. Uh, you can find blog posts about Jones uh, in detail, written again by my great colleague John Lustria on our website, civilwarmed.org. You can also find um, Lots of content about Jones out there that uh, John has written uh, various places on the internet. In the time aboard the state of Maine that summer, uh, she is going to participate in voyage, numerous voyages that are going to carry ultimately about 3,000 wounded and sick U.S. soldiers away from Harrison's Landing, including some who had been previously held at prisons in Richmond, in Confederate prison camps. This is what she wrote of these voyages. She said, Quote, each of the Union soldiers had some word of gratitude. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you, miss. Oh, that I were able to remain among the suffering always. I have shed more tears since they came aboard and yet felt happier than I've been in months. As she handed out food to the sufferers, the food that actually had been donated by many of her students before she left Pennsylvania to head towards the front lines, uh, she said this, she says, quote, the supply of wine and jelly contributed by my dear girls was found very acceptable, as were the pickles which I myself distributed among them. I saw men sit down and cry like children to find themselves once more under the protection of our flag and receiving the comfort they had so longed for. She was uh, Clarissa Jones in the end of the summer of 1862, goes and uh, in volunteers in hospitals ashore at Alexandria, Virginia, where she will help to care for the wounded of the second Bull Run campaign. Uh, she returns to battlefields in the summer of 1863 after her school term ended uh, in 1863, ends up on the battlefields of Gettysburg. Again, if you want more information about Clarissa Jones, visit our website, civilwarmed.org. Now, once the immediate crisis uh, in the immediate aftermath of the seven days uh, comes to an end uh, and, and Letterman continues on uh, with this system of evacuation by water with the Sanitary Commission and Army vessels, he is going to begin thinking forward. He's not going to be, no, he's no longer reactionary. He is going to be thinking progressively. He's going to be thinking about how can he evolve and change medical care within the Army of the Potomac. And the attention of the country had, been, had finally come off of Harrison's Landing. Uh, instead moves north to Virginia, um, more north into Virginia, with John Pope and the Army of Virginia uh, that is going to carry the attention away from Harrison's Landing. It's also going to carry the military attention away from this area. It's going to give Letterman time 
time to implement some of his new ideas that he believes is going to revolutionize health in the Army of the Potomac. So with General McClellan's approval, who is, again, uh, Letterman's boss, as commander of the Army of the Potomac, Letterman's going to begin making wholesale changes to, way, to the way the Army operated in camp here at Harrison's Landing. From mandating the amount of time soldiers slept, to the contents of their meals, to the source of their water supply, to the location and construction of their latrines, Letterman made changes in the Army of the Potomac that made it one of the healthiest military organizations to fight in the Civil War. Hygiene and nutrition were critical, Letterman believed, to the health uh, and ultimately the fighting strength of the Army of the Potomac. But he's also going to be thinking even forward. He's going to be thinking about battlefield medicine. He sees what happens here in the seven days, and he wants to make changes to that. He wants to improve battlefield medicine within the Army of the Potomac. And so on August 2nd, 1862, General McClellan's headquarters here at Harrison's Land is, Landing is going to issue General Orders Number 147, which is essentially written by Letterman, uh, implementing an ambulance corps in the Army of the Potomac, the first organized ambulance system in this United States Army. This is going to take ambulances away from the quartermaster department and put them under the command of medical officers in the medical department of the Army. The orders also instructed, and this is crucially important language that is going to be a true revolution uh, in battlefield medicine in American history. The orders state, an officer in the ambulance corps will institute a drill in his corps, instructing his men in the most easy and expeditious method of putting men in and taking them out of the ambulances, taking men from the ground and placing and carrying them on stretchers, observing that the front man steps off with the left foot and the rear man with the right, etc. He will be especially careful that the ambulances and transport carts are at, are at all times in order, provided with attendants, drivers, horses, etc., and the kegs rinsed and filled daily with fresh water, that he may be able to move at any moment. He will give his personal attention to the removal of the sick and wounded from the field and to and from the hospitals, going from point to point to ascertain what may be wanted and to see that his subordinates, for whose conduct he will be responsible, attend to their duties in taking care of the wounded, treating them with gentleness and care, and removing them as quickly as possible to the places pointed out, and that the ambulances reach their destination. So this is the beginning of Letterman's Battlefield Medicine Revolution. Uh, in August 1862, stretcher bearers, ambulance drivers, and regimental medical teams began training under Letterman's new system. They're going to receive their first test about a month later, in September 1862, in the Maryland Campaign. The Army of the Potomac, what's left of it here at Harrison's Landing, is going to be placed aboard ships, transported north to Maryland and Virginia, and do battle with the Army of Northern Virginia on the battlefields of Maryland. Uh, battles of South Mountain and Antietam fought in mid-September 1862. That, uh, those engagements are going to be the first true test of Letterman's system. And that system is going to evolve in the subsequent battles and engagements being fine-tuned by Jonathan Letterman and his medical team that is ultimately going to be implemented over the entirety of the United States Army uh, in 1864. This is going to see wounded soldiers cared for from the moment they are wounded on the battlefield all the way back to recuperation uh, in general hospitals that are established in the major cities of the North. This is the beginning right here at Harrison's Landing, the beginning of that medical revolution. So in the chaos, in the aftermath of the seven days, Jonathan Letterman is going to bring order out of chaos here at Harrison's Landing. And he is going to bring that order not only to this, just this encampment, but he's going to bring that order wherever the Army of the Potomac is going to go for the remainder of the American Civil War.
Hey everybody, this is Jake Wynn with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine for our On Tour series here on the South Mountain Battlefield in Maryland. We're going to be talking through a series of videos today about the events that transpired on this very ground on September 14th, 1862 during the Battle of South Mountain, a prelude uh, to the most bloody day in American history, the Battle of Antietam. And this battle is crucial because this is going to be the first time that a new medical evacuation system is going to be put in place uh, in uh, this theater of action under the command of Jonathan Letterman, the medical director of the Army of the Potomac that is going to be the U.S. Army doing battle here at South Mountain. So we're going to be talking quite a bit today about uh, the Letterman plan, uh, about the Letterman system of evacuation. But we're also going to be talking too about the events that transpired right here and some of the soldiers who are doing some of that fighting. We are on a part of the battlefield uh, known as Turner's Gap. This is a gap over the South Mountain Range that carries the National Road, a major east-west road through this part of Maryland. And it's going to bring these armies, U.S. and Confederate, to this battlefield. A little bit of a, uh, uh, some background on this particular battle. Uh, September 14, 1862, when this battle begins, we have a Confederate army located just to our west, uh, operating in the Boonesboro, Hagerstown, Martinsburg, Virginia area, as well as a Confederate army operating in the vicinity of Harper's Ferry as well, that strategically important spot. Robert E. Lee, the Confederate general in command of the Army of Northern Virginia, had invaded the state of Maryland just a few weeks earlier. So this is a uh, Confederate invasion, the first Confederate invasion of the North uh, during the uh, American Civil War in this theater of operation. So we have Lee and his army operating west of the South Mountain Range. And to our east, which you can see out in the distance, is the Middletown Valley. Uh, that is a, uh, a piece of ge geography uh, where uh, we have multiple little towns and villages. We're going to make some stops in those towns and villages a little bit later in this series. Uh, places like Middletown and Burkittsville. And then over to the, further to the east, uh, you get 15 miles or so uh, to the city of Frederick. This is going to be where the U.S. Army, the Army of the Potomac under General George McClellan, is going to be operating. They're going to be in pursuit of Robert E. Lee's Confederates. And they're going to clash for the first time in a major way here in Maryland, right on these heights where we now are. Uh, we are actually standing astride right now uh, the Appalachian Trail as well, which does cut through uh, this battlefield. We'll see that again a little bit later when we make a trek uh, just about a mile away to Fox's Gap. So this is Turner's Gap. Uh, this is going to see some major fighting during the day and into the evening of September 14th, 1862. Um, there are going to be uh, units that are going to be fighting here that are going to gain a pretty famous reputation, including a group of Westerners in this uh, Eastern Army of the Potomac, uh, the U.S. Army here, uh, that are going to gain a nickname on this battlefield. They're going to earn the reputation as the Iron Brigade uh, for their fighting literally all around where we are now standing. Uh, another of the units, we're going to bounce over to the Confederate side here, and I have a personal story that I'm going to talk about here. Uh, one of the units that's going to be fighting uh, just around the bend here in South Mountain, uh, south or uh, north of Turner's Gap, is the 19th Virginia Infantry. And they're going to be fighting here, defending, trying to hold back the Union Tide uh, that is sweeping up South Mountain, trying to uh, destroy the Confederate Army. The 19th Virginia has a member in Company K uh, by the name of Private uh, J.G. Martin, uh, age 22 years. Uh, he is among the men fighting here who is going to be wounded on this day. Uh, 5,000 casualties from the Battle of South Mountain. We'll come uh, around on that. We'll, we'll talk about that number quite a bit. 5,000 casualties in this battle, including several thousand wounded soldiers. That's actually the same amount as the first Battle of Bull Run, which is much more famous uh, than the Battle of South Mountain is. Um, you can see the level of carnage has, has risen over the first year of the American Civil War to where a battle of 5,000 casualties is just a drop in the bucket compared to many of the other engagements that are taking place at this time. 
Uh, Private Martin is among the wounded from this battle, and he is among the wounded that falls into a category that is uh, uh, quite terrifying to Civil War soldiers um, and quite horrifying as we look back 160 years. He is shot through the intestines. He is gut shot. Uh, And this is a classification of wounds uh, that is uh, under um, Civil War medical care and an early form of triage that is going to be used by the U.S. and Confederate armies uh, during this war is going to be put into a class of what are known as mortal wounds. These are wounds that are typically considered fatal, that the, uh, the wounded soldier will succumb to their wounds. And this is generally any wound to the core of the body or to the head. There's very little that Civil War medical practitioners can do for those soldiers who are suffering from wounds to the core of the body. Uh, very little is understood about infection. Um, and about head injuries as well. So there's very little that a a Civil War doctor could do for a patient. Um, But what is interesting about Private Martin's case uh, is that there are some extensive uh, things that the Civil War doctors are going to do. Specifically, he is going to be cared for by the U.S. Army. Uh, Private Martin is captured uh, by the Army of the Potomac here at South Mountain. Uh, And his case history is preserved in the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. Uh, And this is an an amazing uh, series of books published by the United States War Department that examines the medical history of the American Civil War uh, and preserves case studies like Private Martin's. And so what I'm going to do now is just take you through that case history. I'll read through it with you all, talk a little bit about it. I will uh, put a kind of uh, uh, content warning on this particular video. As with uh, many of our videos, we, ad- we address uh, some pretty, pretty heavy topics, talking about woundings, talking about Civil War medical care. Um, this case in particular, talking about an intestinal wound, uh, does get to be a little graphic, uh, so putting that warning on here. Um, but I think crucial to understanding the realities of what Civil War battlefields are like, what Civil War wounds are like, and ultimately what the surgeons who are trying to save patients' lives, what they're facing. So this is Case 244, Private J.G. Martin, Company K, 19th Virginia, age 22 years. He is admitted to a hospital, the General Hospital, at Frederick on September 22nd, 1862. So just about a week after this battle, he makes his way back to Frederick, Maryland. Acting Assistant Surgeon A.R. Gray makes the following report of his case. Quote, He was wounded at South Mountain, September 14, 1862, by a conical rifle ball, which entered the right natus, their term for uh, his buttocks, uh, four inches posterior to and three inches above the greater trochanter, or the top of the femur, uh, perforated the ilium, that's the upper pelvis, passed upward and inward, emerging through the wall of the abdomen one and a half inches above the superior spinous process, the center of the ilium, his his pelvis. Upon admission, fecal matter was discharging from wound of exit, and other signs plainly indicated the lower portion of the ascending colon was injured. Symptoms of peritonitis, an intestinal infection, uh, developed soon after admission and were combated by large doses of opium. Simple dressings were applied to the wounds. So just a note on that first part of this case study, opium being used. Uh, One of the things that they do have available to manage pain is opium given out in millions of doses. You can see, just based on this initial description of his wounds, why these wounds are considered mortal. Because rampant infection is going to be the rule in these cases. Uh, Civil War doctors do not have an understanding of germ theory, nor do they have the ability to control infection. But... We're going to see in this case, they're going to be doing some experimenting that is going to help to save the lives of some of these patients. He goes on, For four weeks after the reception of the injury, the external, external wound of exit discharged fecal matter. At this time, the wound of exit had greatly contracted and the evacuations took place partly through the regular channels. The constitutional and local symptoms of hospital gangrene began to appear. At this time, at the wound of entrance, At the edges were indurated and everted, and the surrounding skin was undermined. The patient was then removed to the gangrene tent, and the wound was cauterized with nitric acid. So, two things to note from this case. Uh, We are uh, 
isolating patients with gangrene, so they do understand infection control in isolating these patients. Um, and also, they're using acid as a way to try to uh, prevent the spread of hospital gangrene. That is important. That is going to be a major innovation that is going to come from the Civil War. The beginning of the conflict, uh, when hospital gangrene first appears, has about a 60% fatality rate. By the end of the war, only about a 3% fatality rate. So we're seeing those experiments going on in the hospitals from this battle at South Mountain and Antietam as well. Nevertheless, the ulcer increased rapidly in size for several days, and fears were entertained at one time. The sloughing would involve the intestine. But by repeated and persevering applications of nitric acid and careful cleaning of the wound several times daily, together with tonic treatment and generous diet, the morbid action was arrested three weeks after its first appearance. During this time, however, the copious discharge of fecal matter through the wound of exit returned. So they did control the gangrene infection uh, with the, uh, technique, the techniques that they were using with nitric acid. Attempts were made to close the opening by means of adhesive plasters with only partial success. After the arrest of the hospital gangrene, both wounds uh, healed kindly with scars. From the lower one, lower one, fragments of bone, probably portions of the laminated structure of the ilium, again the pelvis, um, were removed. Separation was free and the pus very offensive. Early in the month of February, we are in February now, and he is continuing treatment in, uh, in, in Frederick, Maryland. Both wounds again assumed an unhealthy character. The soft parts in the immediate connection with the wound of exit became sloughy, discharging, fetid, grumuous matter mingled with the discharge from the bowel. The bowel could be plainly seen and felt in the wound presenting a healthy appearance. Uh, they go on. on. On October 12th, hemorrhage occurred from the upper wound, the patient losing at the time about 12 ounces of blood. A free incision of the soft parts was made through the entire abdominal wall, ad abdominal wall into which cold water was injected and a large fusiform clot of blood removed. At the bottom of the cavity thus exposed, no bleeding vessel could be seen or felt, and the source of the hemorrhage could not be found. The wound was exposed freely to air, syringed frequently with cold water, and left open for the night. You're seeing what an ordeal uh, this kind of wound could be if the patient was lucky enough or uh, unlucky enough to survive. At six o'clock the next morning, the cavity of the wound was filled with fecal matter, but the hemorrhage had not returned. The wound was cleansed, filled with oakum, which is loose fibers, uh, saturated with a solution of chlorinated soda and one ounce to one pint of water. Tonic remedies with generous diet and stimulants, principally porter and ale, beer, uh, constituted the course of treatment pursued. Both wounds again assumed a healthy granulating experience. A plug of lint was kept constantly inserted into the upper wound and hopes were entertained that it might granulate from the bottom, thus preventing the discharge of fecal matter. His general condition improved gen uh, gradually and he was able to walk about the ward. The lower wound had nearly healed, so he is getting better. All attempts at curing the artificial anus by ordinary means proved futile, and the patient at his own urgent request was transferred to Baltimore on, on September 23rd, 1863 for exchange. So he has now been in treatment in the hospital in Frederick for just over a year, a year and a day. He is treated in the general hospital in Frederick. On September 25th, the patient was transferred to City Point, Virginia for exchange and on September 28th was sent to Chimborazo Hospital in Richmond. The casebook of that hospital contains the following information respecting the case. Quote, fecal matter escaped from both wounds, did well and in five weeks able to walk about. November 15th, 1863, sloughing of exit wound quickly arrested and by December 1st, wound nearly healed. When Ersipolis supervened. During January 1864, a slight improvement, confined to bed with troublesome cough. In February 1864, slight hemorrhage from the anterior wound. In March, 18, in March 1864, severe attack of pleuropneumonia. During April, general health improved, wounds healthy, fecal matter only escapes from anterior wound, and this with intermissions sometimes two or three weeks. September 28, 1864, we are now two years since the original injury here at South Mountain still being treated in the military hospitals of the Civil War. 
September 28, 1864, fecal matter still escapes from the anterior wound. Injection by posterior wound escapes by anterior wound. Constipation. And on October 6, 1864, Private Martin was furloughed for 60 days. And after that, no further information was related by the medical and surgical history of the War of the Rebellion. And we lose track of Private Martin, uh, losing um, unsure of what ultimately happens to him. But he had survived two years with that wound. A uh, very remarkable story. Um, and I, the reason that I pulled out this particular case history, not just because it's, it's particularly gruesome, which it is, uh, but also it shows the evolution and development of Civil War medical care. That even though that these doctors don't have the ability and understanding to be able to, to manage these infections, they are trying and they are experimenting with some new techniques like the nitric acid on that hospital gangrene, which did prove uh, in some ways successful. Uh, so that's one case here at South Mountain, uh, one pa uh, patient history um, from a soldier who fought right on these battlefields where we are now standing. Thank you for an excellent presentation. As you can see from this photo, the need for field hospitals would only grow as the war continued. We will be looking at one of the largest field hospitals, Camp Letterman in Gettysburg, later this year. And a special thanks to you, our viewers, for supporting our programming throughout the year. We welcome your donations to help us continue these programs. To thank the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, please visit the museum's website. It's listed here. On that site, you can make your donation. You can even sign up for a membership and watch more videos. To donate to the Adams County Historical Society, simply use the donate button on the bottom of your Facebook page. Thank you.